From noon, we've been talking about women in politics during the show, and uh, I'll be reading out some of your tweets at the very end. But I'm delighted to say that my final guest in that conversation is a very dear friend of mine, Barbara Follett. Barbara is formerly the Labour Member of Parliament for Stevenage and a groundbreaking campaigner to get more women into Parliament. She's also the former chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party Women's Committee and the co-founder of Labour Women's Network. Welcome. And thank you Lovely so to see you. thank you so much for coming in. Um, when you and colleagues helped get over a hundred women into Parliament, the Parliament that we're noting today, 1997, 25 years ago, uh, not all of them were Labour by any means, but most of them were Labour women, and they were immediately dubbed Blair's babes. I know. Welcome to casual sexism. Yes. You know, it didn't matter. At 52, I didn't mind being called a babe. I wasn't, um, but it was wonderful alliteration. We got 101 women out of the 120 women into, who were elected in 97 into Parliament. And that was by working together, by networking in the same way that the men had been doing, and by informing women. Because one of the ways in politics... If you want to make sure something's not going to happen, you keep people out of the loop. Very much same in news, I should think. Mm. But women were thoroughly out of the loop. And we made sure we got into the loop. And what I love about what's happening at the moment is that we've reached a critical mass. A quarter of MPs are now female. So if we had thought about complaining about the fact that when women stood up to speak in the House of Commons in 1997, I'm not going to demonstrate to you what some of the men did, or maybe I should, mm. which is they would hold their chests and jiggle them to signify breasts. It was when that happened, if we complained about it, they just... The whips would say, so, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. It's fascinating. I, I asked you whether you yeah. arrived here soon enough to, to hear our mutual friend, Eleanor Goodman, one of, one of the giants of, uh, of political journalism. Uh, and I got into terrible trouble because I, she gave an example of a, uh, an MP who used to run his hand down the back to see whether you're wearing a bra or not. And I muddled that up with Dennis Healy, who used to say, oh, hello, dear, how are you? Um, we're now talking today about Neil Parrish and about a Member of Parliament, mm. not terribly high profile, watching pornography in the House of Commons. That's a hell of a journey. Yes. I mean, but rubbing a hand down a woman's back is not on, it's offensive to, to many women, but there's a big difference. But you know, when I got up to make my third intervention as an MP, when I sat down again, the person sitting next to me had purposely left their hand so that I would sit on it, and it happened again and again. So it's not so far off. And, and, and by definition, a fellow Labour member of Parliament. I'm afraid so, yes. This was not confined. It is not confined to one party, I can assure you. The thing that Eleanor Goodman said, and, and you were kind enough to confirm when you came in that, that you had been able to hear her conversation with, with Freddie and Sean, is to broaden it out from that, whether it's somebody putting their hand down when you sat down or whether it's a Member of Parliament looking at pornography in the House of Commons. Eleanor said it's corrosive for democracy and it's corrosive for Parliament. I couldn't agree with her more because what it shows is disrespect. And what we have been getting in the past, oh, I would say, you know, two years, is constant instances of disrespecting other people and disrespecting the electorate. The one thing about Neil Parrish that I like is that he just has admitted what he's done. Eventually. He's taking eventually. Eventually, to be fair. But nobody at the minute even does it eventually. Yeah. They build up walls of lies, which is disrespectful. Fascinating point. My first guest just after noon was the lovely Deanna Davidson, who Tory MP for mm. Bishop Auckland, uh, and she does a programme running up to uh, to noon. Um, and she said, um, I value integrity above anything else in politics. Sometimes it means holding your hand up and saying, I got that wrong. I'm sorry. I had a discussion with the Prime Minister about this and he didn't totally, uh, he didn't disagree with me. Um, it's not just Tories. No. And I said to you earlier, 
that when you've got the Angela Rayner case, and there are two issues with Angie, was it she who told the story about flashing her legs to try and put off the prime minister? Many of the newspapers uh, say it was, not least Dan Hodges, who used to work for the Labour Party. Uh, and secondly, whether or not she was at a gathering in Durham, initially she wasn't with Sir Keir Starmer and other colleagues up in the Durham constituency, and now she isn't. David Lammy having to apologise apologize publicly on television today. So it's not just Tories, it's across the piece. It's across the piece. And... Within Parliament itself, there's a feeling, when I got in there, I was surprised that people felt that parliamentary privilege, that thing that allows MPs to say things without being sued in the chamber, extended to their behaviour, and that they, they could do things with impunity. And you can't do that in the world. And you had a piece just before I came in about the things that are needed in Yorkshire, and somebody was complaining about litter. I see that, I think littering is disrespectful and it goes right through our society. Why is it that places like Switzerland don't have litter? Why do we have it everywhere? Mm. Sean Worth, who used to work for um, uh, Dave Cameron, was saying uh, it goes back to Isabel Hartman's brilliant book about why do we get the MPs <laughs> that we do. Uh, and he was suggesting that you might even want to take a step down the American road of better grilling of candidates and, and, and also of ministers. You know, the, if the prime minister wants to make you secretary of state for X, Y or Z, you've got to pass a hearing. You've got to be grilled and questioned. It would also help when you make a minister if you t if you actually speak to that minister face to face and say what you want very often because there's a huge swathe of people that come in that doesn't happen but the grilling that's where labor women's network was good mm. we would grill and we would ask what we call the agents questions okay is there anything in your life that you would hate to have come out and people quite often forget about things and then you either bring it out or you deal with it but I think we need more honesty, integrity. I couldn't agree more, mm. Alistair. When you look at somebody like Deanna Davidson and the generation of, 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 of women who've come into Parliament now, one other thing crossed my mind, because we're of a similar vintage and we remember those early it's days and word. the Blair Babes, if you like. Do you think that women generally in politics have become more emboldened? And is the flip side of that that they've become slightly more sensitive? Oversensitive. I, I think what has happened is that they now feel able to complain. Because if I'd complained, um, I wouldn't, I'd have got short shrift. You can't take... Never it. crossed your mind to go to the chief whip and say, when I sat down, some idiot had put his hand under no, my backside. not at all, because you had to be better than the boys. You had to take the boys on. And we did. And we, we sort of descended to their level every so often. Mm just to fight them back. Now, so not oversensitive, but they have found a, a, a nerve, a courage that perhaps they didn't yes. have 25 years ago. Also, when, you're, when you go out and complain about almost anything, um, you get a lot of bad, uh, you know, bad reaction as well as good. Mm. Uh, you just have to look at what happens to people in domestic violence cases. They don't want that. I don't want this publicity. Mm. And I think we have to make it possible for the complaints, and I very much welcome what Lindsay and Andrea are doing. They're working together. They're not saying this is one party. They're saying, let's have a look at how this building works. Mm. And incidentally, if I were they, I would also have a look at the building, which should be used for ceremonial purposes and somewhere else should be used for the real work. How interesting. It's, well, I've always said, take them up to Leeds. Yeah. That's the centre of England. <laughs> and let them work in a building yeah. which is not rat infested yeah. or mouse infested, which it was when I was there, and where you're allowed to cable it. I was constantly told, this is a royal palace. You cannot have computer cables. Mm. Um, it's, I find it intriguing that, that all of my guests, and it was Sean Worth from the Tory Central Office, and it was Freddie Gray from The Spectator, and Deanna, and Eleanor, all of whom made that point, that, that it does potentially jeopardise our trust and faith 
in our politics. Now, am I being over dramatic when I say that's actually the that's the profound thing? If people just look at all of this stuff and say, come the May 5th elections or the general election as and when it comes round, do you know, I just can't be bothered because they're all as bad as one another. You that see, is a profound problem. That is totally profound because you remove yourself from the democratic process. You remove your voice. You remove your influence. And you say, they're all the same. I'm not having anything to do with any of them. And then, of course, they can do what they like to you and to your family. And that has indeed been happening. You get terribly low turnouts across the world. Sure. We have rather higher ones, in yeah. fact. You, you also you, get good people not putting themselves forward. No, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier on Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the speaker, um, suggesting that it was time for a speaker's conference, but, but mainly to look about who employed whom and what those terms of references think, were and the need for proper HR to look after, whether they're men or women. Is he right on that score? He is completely right. What has happened is that over the years, a sort of a system has grown up which isn't regulated. And actually running, uh, the average MP has about five staff. Running those staff, it's, it's, you know, and looking after the HR side, it's a lot of work. Mm. I think it would probably be a better way with a central HR department, as long as you gave the MP the right to choose the staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a final uh, area of questioning, um, and it, it, it just struck me when I read it this morning in the Telegraph, and I knew I was going to be talking to you. Hey, surprise, surprise, the chairman of the Conservative Party, Oliver Dowden, who is a good bloke and a good man, <laughs> saying that our plan is, ere long, to have 50% of Tory MPs women. I read it this morning and said, you know what, we change things in 1997, and the change is still happening. Mm. I never thought in all my life that I would hear a Tory minister say that. It's going to be blooming hard to do because... Oh, absolutely. And well, I've got a couple of supplementary questions on it. But Deanna Davidson, youngster, yeah. 2019 intake, behind the red wall, she doesn't want quotas. She wants to be the best candidate in front of the selection committee. She was one woman out of three candidates and they chose her. I fought for all women shortlists because otherwise we'd have had to wait 200 years to get women up to 50 percent. But I never stood in an all woman shortlist because I thought I, if having fought for it, I must now show that I can do it on my own. So Stevenage was not an all woman shortlist. Mm. But we don't need them anymore. We had a sunset clause in the legislation we put through in 2002, which allowed the reintroduction of all women shortlists. And that sunset clause for Labour has been reached because more than 50% of the Parliamentary Labour Party is female. Mm. It's not the case with the Conservative Party. Sure. OK. And my final question is this, and again, I put it to my other guests, it's about leadership, in my humble opinion, whether you're talking about the leader of the Conservative Party, the leader of the Liberal Democrats Party, or the leader of your own party, Sir Keir Starmer. If they were strong, powerful and totally respected figures, half of this stuff wouldn't be happening because people wouldn't dare. Also, people would allow them some human error, but there's so much error going on. I'm, I'm banging them all collectively together, which is not fair. There's so much error going on that people are just complete. It's like a bad marriage at the moment with the prime minister. He's got very little rope left. Would you not accept as well, because you're one of life's great impartial people, although you're a former Labour MP, but you have a very open mind on these matters. Um, Sir Keir Starmer has admitted as well that maybe he's banged on a bit too much about Partygate. And what the people out there would really like to hear more about is what he would actually do if he formed a government. I mean, it, it's not a charge sheet just for one leader. It isn't a charge sheet just for one leader, but some of the charges against at the moment against um, Boris Johnson are far worse. Mm. I think banging on a bit too much, yes, we all are guilty of that on and off. Um, and I'm glad Keir said it. They, people are, I mean, you and I wake up probably in the middle of the night, nuclear war, shortage of mm. food, cost of living, um, shortage of staffing, you, you know, in the care homes. We're in a terrible state. And what do we talk about? Fascinating. Uh, great to see you. 
Hey. Perfect witness on this conversation about uh, women in Parliament and what they face and what they don't face. I don't think you've ever told me that story about sitting down only to find <laughs> a hand. But goodness gracious me, that's way back I have when. Never. Um, uh, do me one final favour, and that is give my regards to your lovely husband. And uh, I hope that both of you will come back and see us again sometime soon. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Very, very much indeed, Barbara Follett there.